everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Shabazz. Hello! Hi, Christian. How are you? It's great to have you, and yet another grand spanking new MVP. So congratulations! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, it's it's uh, for people that might be watching the series and might think, like, I only go and select the people that just get their, their uh, MVPs. Like, no, I think this, I don't know what episode, we're in the 130s. Um, wow. But, uh, yeah, the... But it's uh, you know, open invitation to any MVP. The series was started so I could get to know MVPs around the world and in other areas. So you're an enterprise mobility. Well, why don't yeah, you, that's correct. Before we dig into that, why don't you give us the introduction, who you are, what you do, where you are? Yeah, so uh, my name is Shabazz Da. I'm based in the UK. You couldn't tell by the accent from the north of the UK. Um, I work for a, um, a net company. They're a Danish-based company, but they've got a, a presence in the United Kingdom. So I'm, I'm a senior infrastructure specialist, and my main specialities are around Microsoft 365, uh, Endpoint Manager, and also um, I'm big as your virtual desktop fanboy. Um, so yeah, those are sort of my skills. Um, yeah, I've been, been in IT for about 15 years now, and I'm just really into the whole cloud thing, really, and really enjoying it. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm interested in your, your thoughts, and feel free, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine, but with the announcement around Windows 365 and how that changes so much of, like, I, you know, I was never in that role in IT. I've been in technology my entire career, but always had all the friends that that did that, that were yeah, yeah uh, uh, setting up all the laptops for new employees or systems and 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 pushing that out there. So how has that world changed or changing? Um, I think it just gives gives give organizations just a different option. Really, it's not. I don't think it's about replacing anything. Um, there's always going to be a place for for hardware and laptops and you know personal devices. I just think this gives people another option, um, you know, that the pandemic came all of a sudden. No, no one knew that it was going to happen and it came out of nowhere. And there weren't these options around as your virtual desktop was in its infancy. And, and it just overnight, it grew into this massive phenomenon. Have so you ever relied on Hyper-V in production environments? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, uh, okay. and by, by introducing this uh, Windows 365, they've just given it, God forbid there's another another issue like this in the future where all of a sudden people have to go work from home. It just gives businesses know there's another option for us. And, and I think that's all it is. I, I don't see it replacing anything. Um, there's still a, there's still a, and then, you know, what, it's an excuse for, for IT admins to upskill and learn a new technology. Uh, that, that's the way I see it. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the topics that you're focusing on? What are you writing about talking about lately? Uh, a, lot, a lot of hybrid is, is probably the main thing I talk about. Anything hybrid, there's no, very rare we talk about, I'm talking about cloud native or, you know, just on-premises, it's all hybrid. Again, with, with the pandemic, it caused a lot of companies to sort of go straight into the cloud because they were in a short space of time and they didn't have that time to plan their sort of roadmap. But I think now that companies have, have got that time now, they're starting to think, right, we need to maybe roll some things back and go back to a sort of more hybrid role, which is probably supports their organization better. And also um, probably a bit more cost effective because even though the cloud's been here for a while now, it's still not massively cheap um, unless you you automate the, the hell out of it. Pardon my French. But, yeah. Um, yeah. This, yeah, hybrid is a massive conversation I'm having. You know, it's it's interesting. So I so I was originally a SharePoint MVP, so it came from kind of that, that side of things. And... Uh, I actually, uh, my last company, I, we did research and for ISVs, for partners within the Microsoft ecosystem. And I did a study back in, so it was published in early 2017, which you can find out on my blog, Buckley Planet, and the resources, you can scroll down, you'll find it. But around, uh, um, you know, on-prem, hybrid, online from the SharePoint perspective, uh, and and basically Microsoft, when they started pushing the cloud, this is before Steve Ballmer left as CEO, it was all like cloud now, go, go, go to the, to the cloud. Yeah. And there were a lot of us that were just kind of looking at it and saying, it's like, yeah, you know, we're doing a lot of things. It's great. The technology's just about there, not quite yeah. yet. Um, but the reality is that the cost of, you can't just lift and shift and move those workloads over. It's certainly not true in the SharePoint world, like running that 
like what you're doing on prem with SharePoint, moving mm -hmm. that into the cloud, it just was not cost effective. It was so expensive to do that. Now, obviously, the version of you know SharePoint Online as part of Microsoft 365 as part of the infrastructure of Teams. Mm -hmm. It's a very different beast than 10 years ago when we started oh. talking about hybrid. Um, but I mean, how is that? You know, where are the areas that organizations are struggling to move to pure cloud? Kind of what are those common areas where they are remain hybrid? I think it's applications, if I'm honest with you. Um, the, the identity aspect of it has got much easier with the integration with Azure AD and on-premises Active Directory. So that's allowed a lot of businesses, and, and you'll find most organizations now have, an, have a hybrid identity model. So they have the same object both in cloud and on-premises. But I think it's it's legacy applications. That's, again, all the conversations that I have, it's all based on, oh, well, we've got, we've got X, Y, Z legacy applications that are not supported, you know, the, and, and that's... That's where I'm seeing most of it in the application stack, really. As far as you know, um, the sort of end user compute aspect goes, that's that's pretty much there, especially with endpoint manager being able to. And again, there's always people worry about endpoint manager taking over from SCCM and, and config manager, but even that co management is a lot of the conversations I'm having. Companies don't want to go all into Intune and endpoint manager and autopilot, they want that, they still want that on premises. Um, server there, but they want to have the best of both worlds. Why not? Well, and that was always the promise. I think even from the beginning was move when it makes sense to move. I mean, obviously Microsoft, other vendors, and they want to push as hard as they can against that. One of the things that Jared Spataro, so uh, over marketing from Microsoft 365 and uh, you know, had conversations with him at the partner conference back in Houston. So like six, seven years ago, seven years ago, Eight years ago, I don't know. Anyway, a long, long time ago. Time is relevant anymore. That's one right. thing. That's the benefit. It's like time doesn't matter. Um, right. I've actually done a bunch. I think three or four all-nighters this year. Um, wow. Just because I had stuff to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah it, it doesn't do much for productivity the next day, no. but you know, got stuff done. No, but I had conversations about uh, moving to the cloud, and one of the things, and this was kind of the thinking with Microsoft was. Uh, you know, when do they think that they're going to see the majority of pro of production systems all cloud based, meaning no more hybrid, no more on prem in in the cloud? And and he said, oh, we think you know in four or five years very quickly. And the next year, the very next year, I met with him again and we talked about that. I said, do you remember what you said? He's like, yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, do, I said, do you want to amend any statements? He says the data is now showing us in conversations with customers that. Um, we're not putting an end date on the transition. So which meant they were shifting their messaging away from move to the cloud now, you're a fool if you're not in the cloud, to the reality of move when it makes sense for you to move, we'll yeah. continue supporting you what you need. And so Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, in, in saying like, again, in SharePoint world, there is no end date on SharePoint on prep. Yeah, yeah. They're not talking about it. It's not in their plans. I can... I'll give you the inside view, people that are watching. There is no inside plan to secretly shut down SharePoint <laughs> server, you know, the on-prem version of it, like doesn't exist. Uh, but it's the, it's the more embrace of, uh, to your point, bring the tools where they sit, what they what you have now, and we'll make sure that they all work together. So it should be yeah. irrelevant whether you're, you've got a line of business application that is a core data source and as long as you've got the identity authentication issues resolved, it's just pointing to where that data is, making sure it has the right level of access for those people. I mean, even if you look at if you look at the recent integration with um, VMware, like so Azure VMware solution, that's another hybrid service, really, because it supports that on-premises ESXi um, servers as well as your your sort of Azure hosted VMware. So again, it's just another element of hybrid, even though it's integrated with VMware. Still, another hybrid service that they're, they're looking, you know, they're doing. Yeah, hi hybrid, and there. So there's those those issues. I think that's getting to be a better story. There's still a kludgy story around uh, multi-tenant uh, access and the yeah. multi-cloud access and the multi-cloud. Yeah, yeah, the fact that we are, and it's not just MVPs and. Uh, and consultants that are working in this, that it's becoming more commonplace.
for users to be working across multiple clouds and running into a lot of the the the, the authentication issues and movement and, and you know between those those applications. Is that also a part of your world? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm I'm not too versed in in the Amazon Web Services or GCP areas, but but again, um, I'm finding that, that customers that are more agnostic, they they they're not really bothered. To them, Microsoft, AWS, Google, these are all at the same level for them. So they're not they're not too as long as it meets all their sort of um, security requirements, they're not really bothered where it sits. They just want the the best application or the best service that fits their use case. So it might be some services in Amazon. It might be, you know, identity in, in Microsoft um, and some applications in Google. They're not really fussed, I suppose. Um, so yeah, not as, yeah, th those conversations are more with bigger enterprises. That's what I would say, not the, not the smaller types. But yeah, that is another conversation I'm, I'm hearing quite a bit of. Well, it's, it just doesn't exist anymore. At least I don't believe, you get your opinion, but the, of, a, of a company, no matter what the size, to say like, we are a Microsoft company and we will only use Microsoft products, done. Like, uh, uh, you know, anybody that says that is not talking with their end users because their end users are using a lot of different things. And there mm -hmm. is intellectual property from your company that are on the other clouds that are in those other worlds. Yeah, they, they, I've never heard anybody say, oh, we're a Microsoft house or it just, companies just tend to generally. Maybe that was a 90s, early 2000s thing, but uh, you know, used to hear that all the time. But I think, I think most time companies just land in a, in a, with a, with a vendor, like they just naturally, um, you know, progress into a specific vendor. I don't think they do it with a thought of, oh, we're only going to use AWS or we're only going to use, um, it's just because it's just naturally gone that way. And again, it's all dependent on, on integration as well. I suppose integration is a big thing as well, having, um, their different services integrate with each other. And, and it, I think with, again, with, with, with Azure AD, being so integrated with with other public identities and other other public sort of vendors, I mean that's helping quite a bit as well. And that was always one of the fears too. People say, "Well, if you make it so easy to to work across those, like, aren't customers going?" And this was something that like analysts and reporters and stuff. I remember asking that question. It's like, if you make it so easy and uh, to to move across, and they could just as easily move off move off of your stack. And the reality is that you know companies were moving this direction anyway. And if you don't support that ease of use of crossing between, then yeah. they're just not going to select you at all. Exactly. They, again, the, the organizations want that flexibility. They want that agility. They don't want to, if, if they want to silo, they want to silo themselves. They don't want a vendor telling them you have to use ours and we're not going to integrate with anyone else. They don't want, they don't want to be told that, which is why it's better to have that flexibility. Well, having worked in you know in, in the enterprise application space and you know back in the '90s and working with uh, so I I did huge data center consolidation projects and these are months and months long projects to move off of certain pieces of hardware to move out of certain applications, uh, you know when you're talking about like you know business objects, mm -hmm. um, SaaS, you know platforms like that, uh, and you know one of the very valid questions as we go into it is like what is your process to get back out of that that system that was part of the decision making process because in 1996 1997 we had already been burned a couple of different yeah, times yeah. Uh, and and been locked into and then those companies you know part of the fear was they're not going to keep up on uh, on the latest technology that these you know smaller now in, in our world now you know cloud-based solution providers can be very agile, very quick in the development of new features. And we want to have the flexibility to be able to go and give our that user experience and features that our users need. If we yeah. don't provide it as IT, they'll just go around us. They'll go get it in another way. And then it won't be managed by IT, by the organization. We won't have the governance and visibility into what they're doing. Yeah, that that is one of my, one of the things I do like about the, the sort of Microsoft sort of, methodology that they do try and integrate as much as they can with other vendors even you know i mean i know um there are certain services in amazon web services like their um workspaces which is equivalent of uh, abd that integrates with uh azure uh, ad as well so I, I do like the way they they are open to integrating with other vendors and other SaaS applications um again it makes them more flexible for that for that organization that wants to keep an open mind as to their application stack 
Well, then you're also competing based on the features and the unique IP and not on those common services. So again, if you if the it's a given, it's understood that there's no customer out there these days that is in any single camp. They're going to yeah. be using different so solutions but that you make a case based on price, based on functionality, based on support and supportability of the solution that uh, yours is the best capability and can plug into those other competitors. That's that's just the, the where we are now and, and yeah. where companies need to be. Yeah, yeah again, multi-cloud, hybrid, they're all, they're all there and, and, and they're all there based on making the organization, the client's lives easier rather than more difficult. Give them, give them choice. Don't, don't make it so they have to go one or the other. The more choice you give them, the more uh, the more likely they are to go with go with your service. Right. Well, let's uh, change the topics here. Uh, okay. You're know, talking about you becoming an MVP. Uh, I here. This is a, a, a question I I hear a lot, and like, as if it can be uh, canned into a single uh, activity. But what was it that pushed you over the ledge into becoming a, an MVP. What do you think made the difference? So I'm, I'm, I've, I've never really aimed. So, so I've always looked up to MVPs. Um, when I first started with, with community, um, I was very naive and I was a bit younger as well. And I kind of looked at the, oh, I want to be an MVP. And then I actually realized, you know what? Community is not about that. It's about sharing, giving back, helping people. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not bothered now. The MVP is what it is. If, if one day somebody thinks I'm I'm appropriate for it, then then great. Um, I suppose um, the, the amount of that I just started being more 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 visible on on social media. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I do a lot of Twitter stuff, and and I think that was just being more visible and more more just out there helping people. Really, that that's what got me noticed. I would say. Yeah, I, I like that. The MVP award is the icing, but you you got a lot of cake you can eat along the way. You know, there's a lot of benefits that are out there, and I, I, there's quite a few people that had that attitude where maybe they were, they had kind of a plan to go and become an MVP and they were working and making sure they're checking off, you know, boxes of things that they need to do. Uh, and they, they finally just kind of gave up and said, you know, it doesn't really matter. And, uh, you know, cause I'm, I'm doing these things because I enjoy it. I like giving back. I'm just going to participate. If it happens, it happens. And then shortly thereafter, you know, they, they, got the, the 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 recognition so and, and it's i think it's the best attitude to have. It's, it's the most stress-free attitude to have if i'm honest with you and it's it's and i think it's because of that that i've been able to enjoy the, the the content that i do um i've been able to enjoy having those conversations on social media i've been able to enjoy doing user groups i'll be honest in a, in a, in a sort of twisted way that the pandemic has massively helped me because mm -hmm. virtual events have have been uh the, the main thing over the last yeah. 18 months oh yeah i've been able sure. I've been able to present um, in an American user group, a user group in Europe, all from sitting where I'm. Is that, that I wouldn't have necessarily had that that opportunity, and because I've been able to do that, it, it's gotten me be better well known within the wider community, within the global community. Yeah. Um, so that that's helped me quite a bit. And the thing is, it's a passion of mine. It's it, I made it into a passion, and because it's become that passion in the content that I do, you can see that I'm enjoying it, and it's. It's, it's it, like I said, there's nothing, I probably think just being more vocal and being more, helping people more really got me noticed, I would say. So what are, what are kind of your, uh, your, your primary community activities? Like how, how, what do you, what do you do? What are your primary contributions? So I, um, I've got a YouTube channel. So my, my, my moniker is I am IT geek. Uh, so you can find me on YouTube, um, youtube.com slash I am IT geek where, Again, I just do, I do sort of um, series of videos. So I've done a series on identity. I did a series on Azure Virtual Desktop, uh, like a zero to hero with a, with a colleague, with a friend of mine, Simon Lee. Um, and I just do, just do videos. If I have an idea, I'll, I'll blog about it and do a little video demo. Um, again, I have a blog. Again, I am IT Geek, HTTPS, I am IT Geek.com. Again, just blogging about, I tend to blog more on there about uh, when I do certifications, I'll blog about my experience, the resources I used and what the exam was like without giving away everything, obviously, just helping people who with the resources I used. Um, one of my, the, the things I enjoy the most is presenting. It, it's it's something that I've, I was always nervous about. But then again, during the pandemic, I got to do it virtually and 
and I've hopefully got a few in-person gigs coming up as well. Yep. Um, so those are my three main sort of sources of, of um, helping the community that I tend to do, user groups, uh, presenting, blogs, and a video. Yeah, that is, uh, so I agree with you. I mean, it's just, as far as uh, opportunities for people that are not MVPs that uh, you know, would hear all the time, and I was participated in uh, and all over the world presenting at SharePoint Saturday events, these different in-person community-driven events, as well as bigger conferences. Uh, and, and the struggle with those as an organizer of those kinds of events is always finding new people and, and people like, well, I don't want to go and do that. It's like, look, you're going to be in front of 20 to 30 people um, presenting. Nobody's expecting you to be perfect and get up there. Just, you know, be prepared, have a good topic yeah. and, and, and try it out. But how difficult it was to find people so that from the comfort of your own home office, joining and presenting that way is a good you know toe in the water for people an introduction into that and there are just so many different opportunities my user group i'm on the board for the uh for the we call it the microsoft uh user group utah or mug it which is an <laughs> awesome hashtag uh, and it was available for some reason as a you know site and tag uh but that we're we still struggle to find speakers and so we just recently did a call for speaker we're like anybody in the world it's all virtual. You don't have to be here you know, and push that out there. One of the things, so I started a user group as well. Again, during the pandemic, it was all virtual. And the two friends of mine were all, so I'm, I'm from a place called Bradford. It's a little city within and off of the UK. And two of my friends who, who again, I got to know through Twitter and the, the cloud community. We just started a, a Bradford cloud user group. Um, I think because we're fairly new, as I said, say less than a year, we've not had an issue with, getting speakers and because it's virtual the problem we've had is um engaging people and getting people to actually join the user group because what i've found is people are starting to get virtual uh, almost like vir yes virtual fatigue is the right phrase even i'm getting it do you know what i mean um but that's been the most difficult thing from a user group as organizers with perspective i think what makes me think now is virtual fatigue real is it it's not phantom fatigue. It's a real thing. <laughs> Play on words for the word virtual. It's, <laughs> I, I'm virtually fatigued. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy to get burnout and, mm -hmm. and no matter how good a job you try to do in that engagement side in conversations and, and emails and other things like I, I, I wish there, I think one thing that's kind of died off that I've seen are the kind of open hour, just no topic, dial in and just chat with people. When the pandemic first started, like I loved that. Yeah. And so I used to, I, so I started dropping in. I had friends down in South Africa. I participated in some there over on the East Coast in the US, um, in Australia, where I just dropped in and be like, oh, we got a guest from, you know, from the, the Western US, so like, hey. And, and uh, so that, that was great. I'd love to see more like that. But uh, yeah, I am so ready to get back to in-person. I know we're, we're looking to organize an in-person user group, hopefully in October. Um, and there's like today, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, there's um, comms versus happening. Yeah. Well, oh, that's UK. right. Yeah. Uh, and I just look at the people who are jotting all the photos. It looks, they look like they're having so much fun in person. Yeah. Um, people, I wonder just, what the numbers are like. That's, that's the thing. I, so I did. sold out. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, like we, I know we had our, my first event was, uh, like three weeks ago, four weeks ago and flew to the Midwest. It's a smaller event, um, but the North American collab summit, but it was great to see people in that interaction, even with the small numbers, I mean, got so yeah. much value out of doing that. Um, I think there's another one coming up in, so I'm presenting at the South coast summit, uh, in October that's in Southampton, um, in the UK. So I, I know people who are coming from abroad, people from Europe are coming to that as well. Um, so that's like a Microsoft 365 free. That's a free event as well. Um, I'm really looking forward. That'll be my first in-person conference since the pandemic. So I'm massively looking forward to that. Yeah, we're, we've started to talk about, we, we did for almost a decade, we did our, uh, we rebranded it from SharePoint Saturday to Microsoft 365 Friday. So we moved it to okay. Fridays and then expanded the content within it. And when we did that, we moved it. There's a cultural difference here in Utah with the, you know, the rest of the, the, the world where, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, where we doubled our numbers by moving it to Friday. So we're, wow. we're sticking with that, but we're, we didn't do it this year. Right. And uh, so our last one was in February of 2020. 
right of just before pandemic and so we're now looking at february march uh you know whether we're going to do our next in person where we're going to try again and whether people will still show up to make it worthwhile to for the cost and time and effort and, and pulling that together i think they will and, I, and again it's we go back to that virtual fatigue i think people want in-person events now yeah um i, I think i agree do. i i do yeah <laughs> so, same well, Shabazz, really appreciate your time and, and meeting today, getting to know you. Hopefully, we'll see each other at the next MVP Summit, which maybe, maybe next year it'll it'll happen. But uh, in the meantime, people want to find out more about you. Where do they find you out on social? Yeah, so I'm on my Twitter handle at Shabazz Dar. Um, you can hit, hit me up on there. I'm, I'm very approachable, obviously, on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, and you obviously just just obviously watch my YouTube channel and my my blog site. So yeah. Excellent. We'll have all the links out on the blog post, of course, out on buckleyplanet.com. And so for that, it's Shabazz, really thank, thank you for your time and we'll uh, connect with you soon. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you.